and it's in Clara Afton. The Clara Afton theory is, is a simple one. The idea that the name of Mrs. Afton, or Afton's baby mama, is Clara. This idea comes from the Between Nights cutscenes from Sister Location, where Michael goes home and watches his favorite series, The Immortal and the Restless, while eating popcorn and potentially exotic butters, which features a vampire wearing a purple suit, swearing up and down that the clearly vampire baby isn't mine. And the mother of the child in this scenario is named Clara, which instantly people latched onto and are now adamant about it being the mother's intended name. And while yes, it's certainly possible and is fairly on brand with FNAF logic for lore at least, we haven't really had a name reveal this subtle before in the games. We got the names of the five missing kids outright. William was mentioned by name at the beginning of this game. Michael said his name at the end of this game. And I don't think that there's really been any subtle name reveals aside from Cassidy, but that takes place outside of the game series. Plus, the vampire's name is Vlad, not William, which could also easily be a reference to Danny Phantom if you want to play the whole game like that. Like, I, I, I don't know. I just I just don't think that the mother's name is Clara, but it's still a theory. In at nine, the blob. The blob is an amalgamation of various animatronics that appears in FNAF Security Breach as a secret antagonist. The blob's main head has a mask identical to that of Funtime Freddy, but with black eyes. It also appears to be some larger version of Molten Freddy after the pizza simulator fire, but with more animatronics than those who were present in that fire, somehow. With parts of Baby, the puppet, which were both there, and then Chica, Mangle, Bonnie, and several Endo Mark IIs. But thanks to the Fazbear Frights books, we may know who this mysterious giant blob is, or was going to be revealed to be. While yes, the game released on December 17th, 2021, that was not the original intent. The original intention was for this game to come out in like 2019, I'm pretty sure. But then various delays and expansions to the game ended up causing the game to come out two years later. But those game delays didn't delay anything else, which meant that the Fazbear Frights books kept their schedule. And a similar creature ended up appearing in those books, which was ultimately controlled by Elizabeth Afton, who was possessing Baby. So, could this blob be Elizabeth coming back? Or maybe not, since Baby's eyes aren't lit, and it seems to prefer the face of Funtime Freddy. And it ain't fake hero. Michael Afton is a troublemaker, in my mind, alright? Like, sure, he seems to be playing the good guy going after his father, but really, Michael, to me, just seems fairly entitled. Sure, he says he's trying to right his father's wrongs and whatnot, but looking at him, he's not really doing it because he's a good person. He's doing it because he feels bad, and not because of some higher, noble purpose. He blames himself for getting his brother killed, which is understandable, but also, this subsequently means that anything he does, he's doing to make himself feel better about his mistakes, because in the end, nothing will really bring his little bro back. And he doesn't even really have the gall, the nuts, the cajones to actually stop his father once and for all. He says he's going to come find him, but when he does find him in FNAF 6, he doesn't burn the place to the ground to stop him. Henry's the one who does that. Henry's also the only one willing to sack up and actually try to stop William. And that just shows how not serious Michael is about this. If he really wanted to make sure that William was stopped, he wouldn't have let himself burn in the FNAF 6 fire, okay? But he does. He lets himself burn so that he won't have to feel the regret of hurting his brother and the curse of knowledge since he knows what his father's doing. And it's seven Golden Freddy. Some people believe that the one possessing Golden Freddy is Crying Child. This is mostly based on the It's Me hallucinations from FNAF 1 and the reveal that the older brother has been our player character over the first six games in the series, excluding FNAF 4 and potentially others depending on uh, things that get revealed later on. So why would people believe this? Well, it's because it would explain Golden Freddy's signature line of It's Me. Since if we do play as Michael Afton in the first game, It's Me could just end up being Crying Child trying to communicate with his older brother as to who he is. It could also explain the constant use of the phrase It's Me in the security logbook, since some also believe it to be possessed by the spirit of Golden Freddy, or the two spirits inside the book are also those inside Golden Freddy, which makes no sense to me because why would two people be possessing multiple things and the same two things at that? Anyway, with the line of It's Me being explained easily with the crying child being Golden Freddy, it leads to some to the conclusion that that must be the way Scott intended it, but uh, Hey, what do I know? It's not like I've made 365 FNAF videos on my own. Oh wait, this is the 366th. Not even kidding. I counted. I, I'm, I'm being legit.
Like, this is my 366th FNAF video. And it's six, imposter. Sus. Some thoroughly believe that this burn trap animatronic, this new version of the Spring Bonnie animatronic, to not be William Afton, and instead possibly Henry Emily, William's business partner and the father of his first victim. Why do they think this? No idea. However, I can kind of see why, but it would simply just be due to inconsistencies. Since seemingly the endo for this version of Spring Trap also has the same endo as the Glamrock animatronic, or the ones that we see in what is honestly the scariest part of the game. At least, they look similar. Since if this was Acton, the Endo should technically be the first version of the Endo Skeleton. My explanation for this is simply because they had to model this Endo for the files and they were kind of in a rush to release something after already delaying the game multiple times, so they used just a, the normal Endo that they already had and then added some spring trap bits onto him. And since he's so destroyed, it's really difficult to determine whether it's the same design as Scrap Trap or not. And since Henry was also in the FNAF 6 location potentially, it could have been him. But again, I, I doubt it. How quick do it in number five, death. These are the things that I tend to come back to when I'm talking about Mrs. Afton, but really it's only because that's all we have to theorize about her. The possibility that Mrs. Afton died in a car crash is very possible, yet the idea that she did is so unfounded and really only has grounds in the FNAF music video world, like the original FNAF music video song world, you know? Particularly the living tombstones, since this seems to be where this idea originated. Not an animated Minecraft music video like I've been thinking, which honestly kind of shocked me, but either way, there isn't really any real evidence in the game or in any real part of the lore that suggests she died in a car crash. I'd say none that suggests that she died at all, but it's FNAF, so I feel like that's a pretty safe bet. But other than that, there's really no explanation as to what happened to Mrs. Afton, and people still treat what they've seen other people say online as fact without checking it out for themselves. Like one person believed that the whole music video thing was right and then they posted it on Reddit and then one person read that and thought it was canon and then it just grew from there and now a lot of people believe that this is an idea without even knowing where it came from. It came from a music video guys. It's not canon. And for Vanessa. In the best ending there are quite a few confusing moments. The most confusing one for me at least is the idea that Gregory would go get ice cream with Vanessa when she's done trying to kill him because you know all of a sudden she has a been trying to kill you for six hours. Why would you do that? Some seem to think that it's because they're related or representing the dead Afton kids. And thanks to MapHat, there's a little more evidence to this theory. The ice cream that Vanessa gets while on the hill in the best ending is very reminiscent of the ice cream cone that lured Elizabeth into baby's arm grabbing or scooping range, I guess, however you want to say it. I feel like scooping is kind of more accurate considering how we're talking about ice cream here, but hey. There's a cone with ice cream on top. And while it's not the same design, this time around it's mint chocolate and chip. I mean, I feel like ice cream in general, we've only seen ice cream this these two times. So yeah, I feel like it, it's it, it's a good it's a good thing. I feel like that's a good comparison. Getting close to the end of number three, Glamrock Freddy. There is a popular theory going around that once again, people are treating as fact. The idea that Glamrock Freddy is possessed by Michael Afton after the FNAF 6 fire. That his soul went on to possess the Freddy animatronic somehow after the place and he himself burned to a crisp. Since Glamrock Mark Freddy does give off a overprotective Big Brother vibe that juxtaposes well with the crying child vibes that Gregory gives off. However, I, I personally I don't really think that this is true at least for the moment. I'd love for it to be true, but for the sake of Devil's Advocate, let's let's think about that. While it would make sense from a literary standpoint, the rules that Scott has established in this universe wouldn't allow for this because the games and the books have made it seem like Remnant can be burned away with fire. And while this may be false, see William Afton lied to us about Remnant for more information on that, links in the iCard, fire would still help in preventing the creation of Remnant. That's the conclusion I came to in that video. Thus preventing Michael from actually creating Remnant and latching onto something. Especially something that showed up after a whole mall complex was built on top of where he died. It just, it seems like a bit of a stretch to me. And I'm the guy who swore up and down that Michael was a rebuilt crying child, and I'm saying that this is a leap in logic, alright? I mean, I still think that that could be possible, but like, less so now, but... But ultimately, and in number two, the one you should not have killed. I adamantly stand by my stance that Crying Child is the one you should not have killed. And I know that it goes against what MatPat says, but I truly believe that there is more evidence for this than there is for Cassidy being the one you should not have killed. And MatPat, if you want to talk about it, hit me up. We can figure this out together. We know that Crying Child dies in 1983, which is the same year that Charlotte ends up dying and possessing the puppet. However, we only know of seven animatronics that definitely existed at 
at this time. The four from Sister Location that made up Circus Babies Entertainment and Rental, Funtime Freddy, Funtime Foxy, Baby, and Ballora, and then possibly Fun Type Chica, but that, that's a that's a whole other thing. Since those are said to be some of the first robots that were made according to the FNAF AR Faz Facts, the Spring Bonnie and Spring Freddy animatronics that are used in FNAF 4's location, and the Freddy used in the location that Charlotte is watching from the outside when she gets killed. There is no clear golden Freddy that Crying Child could have possessed. Not uh, not taking into account potentially Fredbear being golden Freddy, but proportions kind of negate that. The other mini games from FNAF 2 don't count as well since we can't really be sure what year they take place in. And aside from no Golden Freddy, there is no animatronic around for Crying Child to possess when he dies in the hospital. Um, unless William is just the absolutely god-awful most atrocious father and the hospital would not have let that happen, just saying. And finally, into number one, Bonnie. This is an interesting theory from Reddit user was that the bite of underscore 87 on the Game Theorist subreddit. The post didn't get much love, but it was certainly interesting. Was that the bite of 87 asks if the burn trap animatronic is using the disassembled Bonnie endoskeleton. Quote from the Reddit post, So I have a theory that Burn Trap is using the disassembled Bonnie robot. Let me explain. So you know how Burn Trap has an intact animatronic foot even though no other spring trap or scrap trap ever had them? Management might have disabled Bonnie, and there could have been a body of a glitch trap infected person in there, which explains the dead rotting corpse, and Afton could have taken over, but is weak, which explains why he still needs a recharge station. That is all I have for now. And you know what? This is actually pretty decent, and MapHat also talked about this theory. However, considering how Afton Captain's body is in the robot. I don't even think that he, using someone like possessed by a glitch trap, I don't think that he would move his corpse. I, I feel like that's a bit of a stretch. Like it wouldn't really be necessary if his consciousness is in glitch trap. And I, I don't, I don't think that any reluctant follower would be willing to move a rotting corpse. You know, in a ten bullying. Not talking about what it led to, but specifically the tormenting of the younger brother. While common among siblings, especially in media, this is just damn cruel. I mean, like, even Roderick wouldn't have ripped off one of Greg's plushy heads and then tormented him with it. So, the bullying here is a damn shame. And honestly, the fact that William did nothing to reprimand his son for tormenting his other son only makes this worse, I'm sure. Which eventually caused him to escalate, and essentially escalate so much that, well, we all know what happened. But, even without that, brothers who torment their younger brothers like that are cruel. Like, I tormented my sister, but I didn't like destroy her stuff so I could use it as a mask to then scare her even more. And I'm sure that he doesn't like just wear it to scare a crying child either. He probably just walks around with it on the regular just to make his younger brother mad since you know he's wearing your stuffed animal's face. And at 9, encouraging Gregory. Assuming that Glamrock Freddy is possessed by Michael, even if I don't think it's likely, Michael as Glamrock Freddy straight up encourages Gregory to risk his life in order to get out of the pizza plex when in all honesty the safest thing to do would be to just keep him either in your stomach or in your green room until 6 a.m., especially after the doors closed and he was definitely stuck. There was no need for this daycare secret escape hatch escape plan thing, okay? You could have just gone back the way you came and everything would have been fine. You would not have been suspicious since you'd have at least um, appeared like you listened to Vanessa and went back to your green room, and then Gregory would have been safe, especially after you knew that there was a crazy buddy running around looking to slaughter people. So yeah, if Glamrock Freddy is possessed by Michael, he did a horrible job at protecting his surrogate younger brother, which kind of hurts the whole he protects Gregory because of crying child thing, doesn't it? And it ain't listened to his father. Now this takes a bit of assuming, but less than assuming that Glam Freddy is possessed, so it's gonna be a spot higher. We learn in Michael's final speech in Sister Location that he went to find his sister because his father asked him to, saying something along the lines of, I did it, I put her back together, just like you asked me to. which is yes in reference to baby, but the issue I have with this is why did he listen to his father? I don't think he learned about the horrible things his father did because of baby. Like I think he must have learned about it beforehand, maybe when he got crying child killed since he was freaking out because the animatronic jaw should not have been able to crush his skull. And even if he didn't know about what William was doing, honestly that could make this point even worse. Like what other things did William ask his son to do, either while he was stuck in Fazbear's fright or before that, that Michael did without question. That's a thought that really worries me, 
And maybe Michael has more to repent for than just hurting his brother. And it's seven bad babysitter. Now, while we don't know the details about what's going on inside the Midnight Motorist minigame, although I think uh, I think we kind of figured it out, link to that video is in the iCard. I think it's safe to say that this is the Afton family, and particularly the Afton males. Seemingly, Michael was babysitting crying child while their father was um at work, but Michael was just watching TV and not his little brother, which allowed his little bro to break his window and go to the pizza place yet again, which I'm sure made his father so angry that when he got his son back home, he wasn't the nice father I'm sure he pretends to be. So Michael's negligence ended up getting his little brother in trouble and God knows what else, because all he wanted to do was watch his show, which is possibly immortal and the restless. Which makes this even worse because it's a fucking soap opera. And before any of you get mad at me and tell me that this isn't freaking Michael, okay, the one who tells William to go easy on crying child is most definitely Michael and not William's wife, since this is after William started killing, so his wife was gone. Plus, it's the same gray shirt that Michael wears at like literally all the time, and he's in front of the same TV that we sit in front of in Sister Location. That's about as clear cut as the series gets. And it's six, Walking Corpse. Now, Sister Location also ends with a scene of Michael walking around town literally purple and smelling god awful. Some see this as his body rotting thanks to the animatronic parts inside him. I like to think that it's because the robotic parts inside him are beating up his inside so much that it's causing severe bruising. Because never have I once seen a decaying body be shown as purple purple in color. Every version of rotting corpses, especially like living corpses, with zombies being the most common example when rotting are shown as green in cartoons, like Minecraft zombies for instance, or plants versus zombies. So the purple in reality just can't be decay because that it just doesn't work, it doesn't make sense. But if it is the case, walking around in public smelling like that is a crime in and of itself. Holy crap. And if it's not the case, this man obviously hasn't showered in ages, and whether that's due to a personal choice or the choice of the animatronics inside him, damn, it's still a horrifying mistake. A damn shame is what it is. Halfway through into number five, burning. FNAF 6 is a pretty good game. It was something new and probably the most interactive FNAF game we've ever had since we got to make our own pizzeria. But the ending, while good and one of the most iconic speeches of all time, Michael letting himself go up in flames as well as the whole pizzeria is seriously dumb on his part. Like bro, you've seen your father come back to life just as many times as anyone else. Like at least keep kicking around for another year or two to make sure he's actually dead instead of just hoping he is. You know that this man is as relentless as Taco Bell after a night of binge drinking, yet you let it go. <laughs> Just think about things. I wish for once one person in this series would actually think something through. And Henry encouraging him to stay just also seems like a bad idea to me. Straight up. Like, I get that you want nobody to remember this, but unless you've killed the parents of all the victims, or everyone who's ever covered the story in the media, people are always going to remember this. So just stay alive, okay, make sure the story is over, and then you can off yourself. Both Michael and Henry, honestly. God! And at 4, animatronic escape. Going to investigate a secret underground facility when your homicidal maniac of a father asks you to is one thing. It's another thing when you become the vessel through which five separate animatronics escape into the outside world to begin wreaking havoc. Like, sure you couldn't really help it, but the canon ending to the game is seemingly the one where you listen to baby and then end up getting scooped. So in actuality, Michael was being uh, just a big old dum dum here. After everything, you should know that the possessed animatronics, even if they are possessed by your sister, are a bad Bad idea, especially if you've been through the other locations already and have been attacked by those very same haunted animatronics. Have you never seen an episode of Supernatural? Like every spirit is a vengeful spirit after this long bro, come on. Just salt and burn the animatronic and then go home. Wait, wait, could the whole like remnant needs to burn thing be referenced to Supernatural? I hope so. Getting close to the end, and in number three, left his sister. Now, don't get me wrong. Allowing yourself to be a vessel for a group of evil d bags is one thing. I really felt like Dean Winchester there for a minute. But the other ending doesn't actually let Michael off the hook either. In the other ending, the non-Canton one, I'm guessing, where Ennard attacks you while you're watching Immortal and the Restless, you end up actually leaving your sister in the underground storage facility for dead. Well, not for dead, since she's already possessing an animatronic, but you, but you know what I mean. You didn't even try to set her free. And assuming that that's what you did in the previous games, you already know how to set them free. So like, why didn't you set your sister free? Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay, my sister and I, 
We don't always see eye to eye. Sometimes she can't take my hilarious jokes and my brilliant sense of humor. But I'd still release her soul if it was trapped inside a six foot tall giant robot. Okay, I would. But this man just leaves. And we know that he knows it's Elizabeth. He just doesn't care. What a great big brother this guy is. You already screwed over one sibling. Why not the other one too, right? <laughs> Speaking of which, can ultimately in at number two, Chomp. I think we all know that Michael is certainly at least partially responsible for the bite of 83. Because while William did superpower the Fredbear jaw, if Michael hadn't put his brother's head in the mouth, it wouldn't have mattered. <laughs> while yes, he thought that he'd be safe because it's an animatronic mouth, how bad can it really be? He still definitely contributed to Crying Child's death. It's interesting the way that like fate works. In this instance, we can really blame anyone for the death of Crying Child, because I am absolutely certain at the very least Michael blamed himself at the beginning. After learning what William was up to and what he did to the animatronic, maybe the guilt lifted slightly, but all that it would really do was assure himself that he didn't have the intention on killing his brother. But either way, without Without him, nobody would have put his head in the animatronic mouth. But yeah, getting your little bro chomped is definitely gonna cause some friction among the family members. Especially when, because of that, you're the only two family members left. And finally, and at number one, nothing. Michael Afton's biggest sin in my mind is his ability to do nothing. Like, sure, he seems to be playing the good guy, going after his father and trying to undo his deeds, but really, Michael to me just seems like he's been playing hero this whole time while not actually doing anything. Sure, he says he's trying to right his father's wrongs and whatnot, but looking at him, he's not doing it because he's a good person. He seems to be doing it because he just feels bad and not because of some higher moral code. He blames himself for getting his brother killed, which subsequently means that anything he does to try and fix that is just to make himself feel better about it, because in the end, nothing's gonna bring his little brother back. And if anything, the FNAF 3 Happiest Day Mini Game is because of Henry, not Michael. And you know what, this guy, he doesn't have the balls to actually end his father once and for all. He says that he's gonna go come find him in the final scene of Sister Location, but then when he does, he's not the one to burn the place down, okay? Henry's the one who does that. Henry is the only one who's able to actually sack up and do anything about this. I mean, he does it in a horribly stupid way, but he still at least does something. If Michael really wanted to make sure that William was stopped, like I said earlier in the list, he wouldn't have let himself burn. He would have stayed alive, made sure that his dad was dead, made sure that his old man had kicked the animatronic filled bucket, and then offed himself. But he lets himself burn so that he won't have to deal with knowing what his father did and live with the regret of hurting his brother. So, yeah, he didn't really do anything. And it's in Ballora. There is the popular theory that Mrs. Afton goes on to possess Ballora. However, I don't really like this theory, because, you know, just don't. Many people who associate the name Clara with Mrs. Afton also seem to believe that she went on to possess Ballora, and I don't know why there's such a high percentage that believe both, but I, still. The reason I don't like this is that it's assuming too much, okay? It assumes that she wasn't alive when he made the robots. It assumes that she ended up dying in an agonizing way, when we don't even really know what happened to her, and it also assumes that she was around Ballora when she died, or that a possessed object somehow was used when creating Ballora or something, okay? But that would be an incredible chain of events, because William did not know about Remnant at this time. And if Mrs. Afton ended up possessing Ballora, I'm sure that William wouldn't have opened circus babies, and if her death was the reason he started killing people, which we have no idea about, then seeing that she possessed a robot would actually probably stop him from doing that, because she would still be a Alive. Yeah, yeah. Um, also, especially when she's in a dummy thick robot. And I mean, her song is in reference to another woman in his life, or at least it can be. So, yeah, I, I doubt that he would have hid inside of walls from his actual wife. And at nine, final reason. What if Mrs. Afton was the catalyst to all of this? What if she was the one who pushed William over the edge, gave him the ideas, gave him the kids, and then vanished or died or left him, whatever the case may be? What if Mrs. Afton was the one behind it all? I mean, honestly, a combination of these theories could be correct. I mean, like, further on in the list, you know, but, like, she also just could have been a psycho or a hallucination. Maybe she died and then possessed Ballora. Maybe she didn't. There's so much in the realm of possibility here that we can never really be certain unless we get told directly by Scott. But maybe William was driven to killing by his wife, be it directly or because of her death 
or their divorce, or whatever the case may be. It would explain why he didn't want to hurt his kids, despite being a certified nutcase, uh, but the closest kid to William, other than his own kids, would have been Charlotte, hence why she was the first to go. I mean, if the mother died or divorced him, his children would be like the last things that connected him to the love of his life, so I don't think that he would really want to hurt them, but yeah, I don't know. We don't know, that's the point. That's the whole point of this list. These are theories, all right? Don't get mad. I know you're going, you've already gotten mad. In a date, divorce. I mean, it's possible again. There may be another reason as to why Mrs. Afton isn't in the picture anymore, and it might not be death. The explanation may not be as brutal as you're probably thinking, at least for her, since I'm sure the divorce settlement would have been horrible for William, especially when he owned a company. The only real way that this could be true is if, like, they divorced before William had gone into business with Henry and bought Fred Bear's Family Diner, though, unless they ended up having a prenup. However, a prenup wouldn't really be necessary if he didn't have anything, so we can't really be sure. But, I mean, that's half the fun, though, right? The matter could just be simple, with William and his wife splitting or getting a divorce for a plethora of reasons, but then that could also be why she's no longer in the picture. It doesn't have to be something dark and depressing or sad, you know? I don't know. She could have just cheated, um, or William could have cheated. Just based on what we know about William as a character, creating personal relationships isn't really a, a top priority for him, and neither is keeping them, so maybe the missus just felt neglected, or maybe she was pushed into the arms of another man, so we can't really be sure, but uh, it's something that we can't really rule out. We can't just be dead set on her dying, even though it is also a likely possibility, given who we're talking about, but come on. I'm just surprised that William ended up with the kids if they did get a divorce. And it's seven, Mrs. Emily. Another theory suggests that perhaps instead of his own wife, that the mother of his children wasn't his to begin with. That perhaps instead, William's children are the result of him either previously being married or having extramarital relations with one Mrs. Emily, Henry's wife and the mother to Charlotte, who is the puppet. It would explain a couple things, like why he would kill Charlotte first outside of Fredbear's family diner for starters. I mean, if this is the daughter of the man who he thinks stole his wife or possible wife, that would probably cause some serious issues in his brain, especially at the state he was already in. It would also explain the whole the baby isn't mine thing from the immortal and the restless. Perhaps his wife was trying to convince Afton that Charlotte was his child, but he couldn't believe it. And again, the whole first kill thing. It, it's, it's very important, whoever the first kill is when trying to determine the behavior of a serial killer and then find out why they actually started killing. But if she was a constant reminder of his wife or the woman he loved leaving him for another man or not leaving her man, it would make sense. It would also explain why Henry just sat there in FNAF 6 and let himself die. And it's 6, death. There are plenty of theories around what happened to Mrs. Afton, and a lot of people believe that she probably died, and honestly, that is a likely scenario. But the interesting thing about these theories comes from how she could have died. A lot of people think that Mrs. Afton died in a car accident, and I mean, it, it's possible, but that doesn't mean that it's canon, but a whole lot of people swear by it. Despite many people insisting that she did die in a car accident, it actually came from a FNAF music video. There are others that think that William killed her, or that she just left him, because she found out what he was into, but then for some reason also left his prime demographic with him. Or maybe she found out what he was into and then William killed her because of that. Something that she died in a plane crash for some reason. But basically, any form of death that you can think of could have been a way that Mrs. Afton died. I mean, like, even if she was a sugar mama who died of natural causes, that can be the way that Mrs. Afton went out. Okay, we can't know for sure. And uh, technically, we can assume that she was under 40 at the time of the children being born if they were biologically Williams and then therefore, like, rule out the whole sugar mama thing. I mean, like, kind of. But, like, William had to get money to start a business somehow, right? So, maybe he had a little little deal. Halfway through into number five, surrogate. What if the missus who had these babies didn't actually have any relation to William at all, and instead was simply a means to an end, and their only interaction was in essence a business transaction? Surrogacy is becoming more and more common, with women being unable to get pregnant due to infertility or health issues and other stuff like that, like Kim Kardashian for instance, but it wasn't really all that common back in the 80s as far as I could tell, um, but if you did need it, it would have cost a lot. And assuming that William was already making money off of Fast Baron Entertainment and the whole circus babies entertainment and rental thing. Maybe he decided that he wanted a kid, maybe to blend in because you know he's a psychopath, and he paid someone to be artificially inseminated. Which could explain the whole the babies in mine line from Vlad, uh, even though it would still be his because I'm pretty sure they would use his own stuff, but you know, I can't be sure. I haven't really 
done that before and I'm not experienced in the field. It would also explain why he got crazy because, you know, he didn't really get the fun part. <laughs> Moving on. In a four psychopath. Then there's the possibility that she's also just the psycho as well. However, it doesn't really mean that she was committed to the same goals as him. Maybe she just wanted to go nuts and kill as many people as she could, but then William was like, no, 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 babe, we gotta kill the younglings first, like Anakin Skywalker. Or she was just the inspiration behind his delirious schemes. Maybe she was even the one who gave William the idea about finding the answer to life and death or whatever he started doing. And the closer the kid was to the beginning of life, the more answers maybe he could get. I mean, it's a stretch and it has no evidence, but you know what? So do half of these theories, but people still swear them by them anyway. So you know what? It's possible. The possibilities with a character we know nothing about are endless, so literally anything is possible. Like, William could have even started killing after she died because he wanted to complete her goal, and then that's why he possesses Vanny, because he reminds her of his wife, and yada yada yada, alright? Who knows, maybe he taped a penny above the door frame to bring him wealth, you know? Yeah, that's personal experience, because I'm still broke. Getting close to the end in number three, Vanessa. Ah, the classic Vanny is Mrs. Afton theory. Now, I know that this is definitely not true, since Vanessa is way too young to be Mrs. Afton, unless she somehow got, like, a chug jug from Fortnite, or, like, an immortal potion or something, but hear me out. If Vanessa turns out to be a time traveler at some point, which would be absolutely ridiculous, but you know what? So is FNAF at this point. Could she be Mrs. Afton? Or, better yet, could she be William's granddaughter, thanks to my theory about a fourth Afton kid? Or, straight up, Maybe Vanessa is Mrs. Afton's other daughter that she had years after leaving William. I don't know. She could have been in her mid-twenties when she married William, especially if it was for the money. And then she could reasonably have a kid at this age in 2021 if the game does take place when it came out. I mean, it would certainly be pushing it in the series, um, but I mean, it does have a time-traveling ball pit and possessed animatronics and possessed people that can't die. So yeah, I don't think that this is too far out of the realm of possibility. I also included this number for the thumbnail because that's going to get so many clicks if I actually choose to go with it. But ultimately, Anna number two doesn't exist. <laughs> is it possible that there was no Mrs. Afton to begin with? Yes. Like I said, anything is possible. William was already crazy at this point, and maybe he created the delusions of him being in love with this woman, who then he made her image into a robot, and then he paid for kids, or maybe he made kids as robots, and then he ended up adopting, maybe, as well. Who knows, okay? He's the single father of a large company like Fastbear Entertainment, so I'm sure getting kids could actually be kind of easy, but then again, he's a male, and they're less likely to actually be approved. Who knows, okay? It's all about the connections that he had, and maybe he got to skip a psyche valve, because, you know. This would put into question, like, the whole animatronics thought Michael was William at first kind of thing, though, because, um, y you know he wouldn't look like him at all because they aren't related. Or maybe this is only further proof that Mike is a robot because then people are like, oh, William, since when do you have a teenage son that looks just like you? You adopted that thing. I don't know. Who knows? Nobody. That's the point. That's the whole point of this list, okay? Let's move on. And finally, in at number one, Clara Afton. The name Clara Afton has to be one of the most annoying things in FNAF history for me, okay? Because nobody treats it like a theory despite that being all it is. The whole Clara Afton thing is just very outlandish because it's a name that doesn't mean anything and it doesn't really belong to anyone because like what it comes from the immortal and the restless and it's just a character in the show like the other person's name is Vlad who's wearing purple so like is William supposed to be Vlad that's that's the same form of logic that you're going with if we're going to say that the character from immortal and the restless who is named Clara is meant to represent the mother fine but like that would mean that Vlad would be William's real name. So we can't really assume that Clara is supposed to be the mother's name. It just wouldn't really make sense for that context. I also believe that Clara is supposed to represent a mistress that William had, and then that's where he got his children. But, you know, we can't really know. <laughs> but that's the whole point. And it tends sprung. So, this absolute animatronic genius, the technician that made the suits, handles the suit maintenance, and is explained to every employee that has to put one of these on, the proper procedure, and how, like, you don't get killed within the suit, ends up climbing inside in a panic in an attempt to make himself feel more powerful when he's facing off the ghosts of the kids that he killed, and then doesn't notice the moisture in the room, the leaking ceiling, just how wet everything is, which caused the spring locks to fail and replace every part of his body with metal. Wow. Which should have killed him. However, this lucky 
Joker somehow managed to get possessed by someone who was so pissed at him that they kept him alive throughout all of his what should have been deaths because they just wanted William to keep suffering. Do you realize how counterintuitive that is? Like the man literally wants to live forever and now you are enabling him to do so. Old man consequences is right. Leave the demon to his demons. Rest your own de soul so that Afton can finally die and then actually suffer in hell for eternity instead of like the dream version you made up while he was recharging underneath the pizza plex. Or I don't know, before he showed up to FNAF 6. Whatever you were doing, okay? Whenever you were torturing him, for all, like, with the, like, the fake hell that you made up. God, come on. And the nine killed his kids. The worst thing that Afton has had have to him, or had had done to him by far, is getting his kids killed. But it's also not something that, like, someone did to him. Like, sure, he may not have directly done it, but his actions ended up resulting in all three of his kids dying. All right, so, yeah, that's why it's higher. Him killing Charlie got Fred Bears closed, which resulted in circus babies having to open, which made him dust off Baby and the other fun dimes, which which were designed to kill in the first place. Then Baby ends up grabbing and crushing Elizabeth, resulting in her possessing Baby. He superpowered the jaw of the Fredbear animatronic to use the new Freddy Fazbear's, which ends up crushing his youngest son's skull, since that was not a spring lock failure. Due to all the, you know, the spring locks not actually being active, that's a whole other point that I rant about way too much. And while you could argue that that was Michael's fault, why would he think that Fredbear's mouth would be that overpowered, all right? If I'm sticking my finger in an animatronic mouth, I'm not, assuming that it's gonna bite my finger off, right? So you just think that it's gonna scare the kid. And as the suit technician, William knew what he was doing when he was making that jaw. And then, he also gets Michael killed when he sends him down to find his sister in sister location, which ends up getting him stuffed with Ennard, which then makes Michael want to let himself burn in Pizzeria Simulator. So yeah, William's actions got all three of his kids killed, but then he still had to keep going after it happened. But since he did it to himself, that's why it's higher on the list. And also, if you like for and you want to hear me rant more about it, be sure you hit subscribe, all right? We, we talk about it probably too much. Uh, we're talking about other stuff too, though, so please watch those videos as well. In at eight, burn, baby, burn. William appears as the optional yet canon final boss in FNAF Security Breach, appearing as Burn Trap, according to his name in the game files, but also that's kind of a dope name. He only appears in the Afton ending or the burn, or whatever, the canon ending to the game, uh, but this form is a result of Vanny downloading William's soul from like the digital realm to his old like hybrid abomination of an animatronic suit like the endoskeleton that has still parts of his corpse um, but also he's kind of upgraded with like a new arm and stuff it seems but also it's so convoluted that we can't exactly be sure what's going on but he has his like his entire lower jaw ripped out uh, he you can see his skull it's still covered in blood he has burnt flesh all over him because he's you know burnt metallic black eyes purple pupil the suit is missing fur, it's open chest, he doesn't have like a midriff. He's ruining all sorts of school dress codes at this point. His old endoskeleton, for the most part, has been replaced in some areas with endoskeletons that the Glamrock animatronics use, making him now taller and having sharp claws. Two of his fingers are replaced with like fleshy fingery bones still, so like he still has parts of his hand. It's horrible, okay? Like imagine having to go through that after going through the FNAF 6 fire. And then after that having to go through yet another fire and a whole pizza plex collapsing on top of you. Yeah, dude, what the hell? Just die already, please. And it's Seven stored his daughter. While we all know that Afton isn't the best father, I think that it's something else to end up locking your robot possessed by the soul of your dead daughter in an animatronic testing facility. What? That seems to be what's going on, and that seems to be a bit too far, if you ask for my humble opinion. But nevertheless, he still did it, and that's what Sister Location is all about. And William was even the one who sent us down there as Michael to find out what's been going on and then we get shoved full of entered bits so that all of those homicidal maniac robots escape. God, did William like know about that plan? Because in FNAF 6, Baby says that she'll make her daddy proud. So was William's intent to send us down there so that Baby could escape? And if that is the case, why did he lock her down there in the first place? I don't know. I mean like if she was your daughter, why not just have her like chill around the house? Sure, she's a six foot tall giant clown robot but the, in the books, Baby was able to transform between Baby and a human looking animatronic at will. So why not add that to this version? And then you can have your daughter back, albeit a little bit more messed up, but like still more like you in the long run, right? This family's messed the hell up and nothing makes sense. But there you go. It happened. It still happened. Wow, that's messed up, man. And it's six single dad. 
All right, honestly, while he may have done some bad shit, we have to at least give Afton credit for being a single dad. In this economy, being a single parent sucks, okay? Like, yeah, sure, you love your kids, they're a blessing, yada, 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 but come on, it sucks, okay? And especially considering how it seems like William didn't even want his kids, the fact that he kept them alive is, wait a second, <laughs> that's right, he didn't. One of the worst things to happen to William was becoming a single father because it did not help the kids. It definitely ended up being worse for them, but no matter what way you slice it, William suffered as well. If he didn't want the kids, Kids, he suffered because he had them. If he wanted them, he suffered because he had to watch them die and it was his fault. If he didn't care either way, his remaining son decided to dedicate his entire life to undoing his father's work and ultimately tried to kill him. It's a whole thing. Michael didn't even consider nursing home, okay? He was like, oh, nope, straight up to the big shuffleboard game in the sky for you, old man. Or, I guess maybe the one probably downstairs. <laughs> Side note, some people think that hell's a punishment, but like if Satan wants us to sin, why would he punish us for doing what he wanted, right? It, it feels like we'd be rewarded. Afton's probably just like bumping, just chilling with Satan. How about doing a number five, Princess Quest? The whole reason that Princess Quest was a thing in Security Breach was to lock Vanny's consciousness away, or to lock the Vanessa part away, and prevent her from regaining control of her own body, okay? So why did William create, or allow for the creation of a fail-safe that undoes all that work and allows her for her to escape? I mean, sure, like, they didn't expect the kid to come along and figure it out, maybe, but given the track record of everything that's happened, you'd think that Afton would have smartened up after at least 40 years, but... You know, uh, I guess not. That's like having a self-destruct button on whatever thing you were gonna use to take over the planet or whatever. Or like if any superhero had a take all my powers button, just like on the suit. Okay, why give it a way to fail? Is that just the neurodivergent in me coming out? But like, still, this is one of the dumbest things that William has done and probably the third dumbest overall. But it's, it's seriously, dude, like what's, why, why have a way to undo your evil plans? It's one of the most ridiculous things I think in this story. All right, I get that it's like so that we can save her and have a good ending from like a gameplay perspective, but that ending isn't even canon. So we could have done without it. It's just one of the dumbest things known to man at this point. And if this is on the list of worst things that happened to Afton, you know this man is bad. Most of the that happened to him is his own fault. Honestly, like straight up, it's his own fault. And for Possessed, assuming for this scenario that Cassidy is the one you should not have killed, this was one of the worst things that William had had done to him. Or maybe he doesn't consider it a bad thing. Like I hinted at earlier, like maybe he didn't think that getting possessed by Cassidy is bad, since the one you should not have killed after all is still keeping him alive. They're doing it as a way to make him suffer, or at least they were making him suffer until sometime between FNAF 6 and Security Breach. So since it's potentially a bad thing, but also could be considered a good thing depending on the angle, it's kind of like midway on the list. But even if he does consider it to be a good thing, or if Cassidy doesn't end up being the one you should not have killed, killing those five kids and making the missing children's incident a thing it, it was a bad thing since it caused basically everything else in your life to go downhill and he does end up suffering extremely only because of that kill and the others plus it means that the law was keeping their eyes on you because you know kids died in your establishment after a couple of your kids had died the missing children's incident wouldn't be something that he'd considered a good thing in that regard but probably he would have considered it therapeutic. Getting close to the end of the number three, Henry. Why did you think that killing Charlotte wouldn't have any consequences? You killed your business partner's daughter. That is gonna be pretty obvious to him, especially when he was already suspecting that you were up to something. Like, he took extra care to protect her. Well, extra care, that's a whole other thing. But she still died. That's gonna be a vengeful father if I've ever heard of one, and he hasn't even needed vengeance yet. After you know that he's after you, or he seems like he's after you, you don't kill him next? Killing Henry could have done wonders for your criminal career. I mean, like, yeah, the cops were already suspicious of you, but as long as they can't find a body, you're gonna be clear again. They didn't arrest you for the missing children's incident, all right? Especially a jury who needs to be convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that you are the killer. If there's no body, there's no forensic evidence. And again, they didn't put you away for the missing children's incident. So like, just off Henry, and then you can stay yourself, or even stay Springtrap, and then not get burned three times, and Michael would still be alive, and you wouldn't have had to deal with FNAF 6. Just a whole lot of stupid. But ultimately, in at number two, Robophobia. This is literally the, the phobia that this game is made for, and like, sure, it wasn't actually the reason that the game was made, like seriously, but this fear is perfect for these games. And while sure, the thought of mannequins can creep anyone out, Robophobia is literally the fear 
Empire of Robots and is surely the bread and butter of not only this series but for William as well. Because William must hate animatronics with a passion at this point. Since his victims possessed them, he got springlocked by one, he can only survive by being in one thanks to his consciousness seemingly being sentient code. But I mean like come on, that's ridiculous. If he isn't scared of robots, that would be a miracle and I think that he kind of deserves to be scared of robots too. Since you know, he's combined with one and that would make him in constant horrific terror which is something that I think we would all love to see but also would fuel him because of the constant agony that he would be feeling. So it would make sense and understandably so um, because I mean if I was killed or should have been killed by a robot and I am now part robot I would be pretty terrified of him. So, yeah. <laughs> and finally, in the number one, baby. That's, that's it, that's the number. Dude, he's the luckiest dude alive, all right? Your little girl was killed by a robot you made specifically to her kids and probably got her design input on, and then you throw her in a storage locker, and then she doesn't try to kill you immediately? That's pretty damn lucky. But if she is the blob, then 45 years later, or whatever the hell it is, come security breach, she does kill you, and you probably, hopefully, at least, I really, really hope that you're dead at this point. Just please be dead. Just, I really hope that it was the blob that was baby, and she got so mad that she just, you know, ended it. Yeah, and I'm putting this at the number one because I just, I hope that it's a thing. Number 10, Crying Child's Fate. Possibly Evan's Fate would be an appropriate title of this as well, assuming that Evan is actually the true name for CC. Crying Child meets a terrifying end. This poor victim and likely also offspring of William Afton's ends up having his birthday at Fred Bear's and is seemingly tormented by his older brother during it. Though really, why Crying Child is such a fan of Fred Bear's when the animatronics terrify him, I don't really get that. But I guess that's also a lot of the FNAF fan base who like to be scared. So maybe CC is scared too, but is also a fan? I don't know. Either way, Crying Child's brother decides the best way to tease him is to take him up to the stage and lift him up to give Fred Bear a big kiss. His brother and his friends stick CC's head in the animatronic, but something goes awfully wrong, and the animatronic bear chomps down on CC's head, crushing it. While CC does survive the accident, he never fully recovers and shortly after dies as a result of his injuries. Number 9, Elizabeth's Fate. Elizabeth probably is one of the saddest stories of all of the Afton family members. When she was young, all she wanted to do was play with Circus Baby, the animatronic that her father had supposedly made for her. Unfortunately, this didn't end up working out. Well, it kind of did work out, but not in a good way. William told her both that he'd made the animatronic for her, but also that she should be cautious around it and that she would need to keep her distance. Kind of some contradicting stuff there, Mr. Afton. In the end, Elizabeth snuck off to play with Circus Baby, being lured away from the group by ice cream. She then ended up being devoured by the animatronic. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want more lists on the Afton family and all of the mysteries within the Afton family, because there are many, please be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. I love diving into all the mysteries and all the horrors. Number 8, Circus Baby. After her death at the hands of Circus Baby, Elizabeth would actually become one with the animatronic, with her soul possessing it and going on to live within that animatronic. Elizabeth's soul would then become trapped within Circus Baby. In sister location, it seemed as though the knowledge of his sister's fate was what inspired Michael Afton to get a job at the underground facility, in hopes of freeing her. It's unclear whether Michael was doing this of his own volition or whether he was compelled to do so by his father William. Number 7, Michael Failed. In the and Michael failed his mission though to free his sister's spirit. There is an ending where he escapes the facility and his true fate, but we'd also learn that the real ending involved him being harmed simply because he came to try and free his sister. Oh no, just I guess kind of like a wrong place, wrong time scenario. In the ending where you as Michael do survive and get away, it's implied that Circus Baby knows the reason why Michael has come and actually attempts to bait him from leaving his safe room in order to confront her and attempt to fulfill his mission to save his sister. Either way that you finish the game though, the fact remains that Michael failed to save Elizabeth, who still is trapped within Baby, or I guess what's left of her, by the end of the game. Number 6, Michael's Fate. Michael doesn't just fail at being unable to save his sister, but he also potentially loses his own life in the process. <gasps> Unless of course he was an animatronic the whole time which could be very well possible at this point. The true ending of Sister Location finished with Michael getting scooped by Ennard and having his insides replaced by the amalgamation of Sister Location animatronics who now occupy that endoskeleton, Ennard. This is how they are able to escape the facility, through Michael. Although Michael seemingly still somehow survives this, not really dying on the inside despite being without presumably most if not all of his internal organs, he continues walking around as normal until his flesh has rotted and then 
then he vomits up the parts of the endoskeleton within him, collapsing to the ground as we can assume there would be really nothing left inside of him to hold him up. Probably didn't even have bones left after that big scoop after all. However, he is somehow revived by Circus Baby's voice, reassuring him that he won't die. You won't die, you won't die. Now presumably undead, Michael continues on in his life forever changed. Number 5. William's Profession One of the creepiest things about William Afton just to begin with is his involvement in these family restaurants featuring live bands made up of animatronics. Live bands. The fact that he even made animatronics, never mind all the weird mad science that goes with that, is disturbing on its own. I mean, these animatronics all look pretty creepy, and I know all the Freddy chains are meant to be like a place of joy and happiness, at least on paper, but these animatronics do not scream joy and happiness to me. They scream terror, they scream at me to like run for the exit. Everything except joy and happiness really is what they're screaming at me. Also just sometimes they're just screaming at me because they're jump scaring me. Number 4. William's Hobby One of the scariest truths involving the Afton family is William's role as a killer. I PG 13 would it up and referred to it as his hobby in the title of this point because, well, censorship and such. But it seems as though this hobby is quickly becoming more like his true profession. William has killed multiple people at this point for, well, for a reason we don't really quite fully understand yet. Though I'm sure he has his reasons, right? I mean, he, he's gotta have reasons, right? Included in the deaths he's had a hand in, albeit likely not directly, are the deaths of his own offspring. All three of his kids, if there are three, I'm pretty sure there's still three either way you slice it, even if Michael is Evan, there's still gotta be an older sibling, and then there's still Elizabeth, so all three of his kids seem to have been taken out by animatronics. Although Michael was also weirdly still alive even after his death following sister location, making us wonder just how human he and perhaps his siblings may really be. Maybe they were never human children. Maybe they were all robots. Number 3. Springtrap Another very dark truth is that William Afton went on to become the monster known as Springtrap. Springtrap is the main antagonist of FNAF 3, where you are a security guard at a sort of haunted house slash museum, created to profit off of the terrible and tragic events that seemed to destroy Freddy Fazbear's pizza and seemingly the reputation of Fazbear Entertainment's reputation besides. William Afton was chased by the spirits of his victims who had come to possess the animatronic suits. He chose to hide in a springlock bonnie suit, but water coming into contact with it caused the spring locks to loosen, malfunction, and they tore through William's organs and body, presumably, trapping him within the suit and in theory killing him. Though of course he seems pretty lively in FNAF 3 as the only true and physical antagonist. And I believe that's after 30 years of him being like sort of locked away, so I guess he's like a spirit possessing the animatronic, or he's still alive. I have a lot of questions. Number 2. Stitch Wraith When you really think about it, William was even involved in the creation of Stitch Wraith, which is pretty astounding and also horrifying. According to the Fazbear Frights book, William was the one responsible for Andrew's death, and Andrew is one of the souls who would go on to possess or become the Stitch Wraith. Initially, Andrew tied himself to William, preventing him from dying in an attempt to torment him. You'd think making your killer immortal would kind of be a bad idea, but I guess Andrew's whole thing was more selfish, not really caring about preventing any further killings or deaths more wanting to make sure that William lived on so that William could suffer ever more. We learn of Andrew's story in The Man in the Room 1280 from the 5th Fazbear Frights book, Bunny Call. Number 1. Immortal William Despite the fact that William has seemingly died multiple times, it appears that he must somehow be immortal. Whether that's thanks to Andrew, even after Andrew left him, or is something that William did to himself, or is perhaps just a coincidence. Every time William seemingly dies in the FNAF series, he comes back. He's as resilient as Michael Myers at this point. He just dies and he keeps coming back no matter what. He's been spring locked, burned alive in a building twice, the second time around seemingly locked up and unable to escape, and yet now he is back as Glitch Trap. This time he has returned through someone scanning a 
barcode from a Spring Bonnie suit that I suppose he still somehow possessed in some capacity. As it downloaded his spirit, his soul, or his essence into the game, allowing William to live once more. I'm telling you, if you ever think William has finally died, do not believe it, because he hasn't. Number 10, appearance. It is possible that Vanessa's appearance could hint at her connection to the Afton family. Many have said that she resembles Elizabeth Afton quite a bit, who appears to have somewhere between blonde and ginger colored hair, more like a strawberry blonde in my opinion, and green eyes. Vanessa shares these features and her eyes are a very standout green color. Because of this, we could consider that she might be related to the family in some way, considering she shares that appearance. Does she resemble Elizabeth so closely because perhaps she is her mother? And has Elizabeth been born yet? Or are we meeting Vanessa Afton before she was married and had children? Where this takes place in the timeline, or which reality even, obviously plays heavily into helping us lock in our speculations as bona fide facts. But also, that timeline's a mess, so good luck with figuring that out. Number nine, our hero. Another reason that Vanessa could be related to Afton is that we could see her be taking on the role of another daughter or some other relation. Perhaps she is the twin sister of Elizabeth who lived and who up till now we did not know about. Vanessa does seem to be possibly following a trajectory similar to Michael Afton's as a hero who is aware of the danger around her and who has set out to stop her father's work, put an end to it, and free those who have become his victims. Now, in this case, not necessarily saving her possible other sister, Elizabeth, who's already been freed, we believe at this point, but instead the child known as Gregory. However, it is possible that this is just what Scott Cawthon wants us to think, but is setting us up for a huge reveal in terms of Vanessa's true allegiance and identity instead. That good old misdirect. Number eight, Elizabeth Afton. The other theory is that her appearance resembles Elizabeth Afton because she is her. But the reason why we know this isn't true and can be dismissed is that we know her name is Vanessa, not Elizabeth. And we know her age is 23 from a scrapped email found within the code of special delivery. The email lists her as Vanessa A, 23 and working in the security department. Well, it just says security, but I'm assuming it's the security department. That has to be our Vanessa, right? I mean, it would be too strange if it were some bizarre coincidence. Also, Scott loves leaving little Easter eggs for us, so it seems likely that this description is meant to belong to Vanessa from Security Breach, who we see as our security guard. So this would then imply that Vanessa is 23 years old, which means, unless this is some alternate virtual inspired version of Elizabeth recreated in a game, something like we saw in Help Wanted, that she couldn't be Elizabeth as Elizabeth died when she was young. So we can dismiss that theory that her resemblance means that she is actually Elizabeth somehow and not Elizabeth's mother. Number seven, robot Elizabeth Afton. I know I just said there is no way that Vanessa could be Elizabeth or be directly connected to her without being her mom, but hey, let's play devil's advocate for a second. After all, if we think back to the timeline and all the hints that a lot of the events in the games took place in possibly like the 70s or the 80s, it seems unlikely that in 2020, where this game seems to take place, Vanessa could be Elizabeth's mom. I mean, when was Elizabeth born? When did she die? It just doesn't really make sense in regards to the already messy timeline, because I can't really figure in how she could be her mom unless that happens after, and it's all very confusing. However, is it possible that Vanessa is Elizabeth somehow reborn? Perhaps like what we saw with Charlie in the books. She was recreated basically as like a robot. Elizabeth in this case could be made by William Afton herself and made to simply appear as human and then be renamed as Vanessa. Or perhaps she is simply a new creation who is a robot made to believe she's William's daughter. Maybe all of his children are actually or were actually robots made to seem like or believe that they were human. Whoa. What? Number six, her age. 23 is a very specific number. What does this possible age for Vanessa tell us about the character? Well, if we had a more clear family timeline, well, that would, that would help a lot. Or even information as, as to if William's children are naturally born of him and potentially his wife or his lover or if they were adopted or, or what. Who are these children? Where did they come from? These are questions I have. Sadly, we don't really have any of that information. In fact, I don't even really know how old 
William Afton is at this point, even though I know he's dead. Like, how old would he have been when he died? When was he born? I got a lot of questions there. So we have just a lot of speculation. A lot of fans theorize that if there was a Mrs. Afton, that she possibly died tragically in a car crash. And it does seem that Ballora is based off of someone who was close to William, possibly someone who brought a lot of joy and love into his life, who he missed. Is it possible that this person is Vanessa, who maybe met him through a job working at Freddy Fazbear's Mega Pizza Plex? We don't know as of yet, but it's a possibility. Perhaps we are meeting Vanessa before she becomes William's love or wife or perhaps just his baby mama. Who knows? Number 5. Vanessa A. In scrapped emails found in Special Delivery, where we also found hints for Vanessa's age based on the area she is listed as working in, we also got a hint as to her last name. Assuming this is the same Vanessa, of course. Her last initial is given to us here as A. Obviously, this has driven fans wild and caused them to believe that yes, she is definitely a member of the Afton family tree. Is Vanessa Afton, however, William's wife? Or could she be another relative, another child of his, or possibly his sister or his cousin? Perhaps there is a less direct connection to Michael, Elizabeth, and William here that could also be explored. But either way, Afton begins with an A, and Vanessa's last name likely does as well. I love connect the dots Easter eggs like this. I need like a connect the dots FNAF book, and it's just like a bunch of random hints that we've gotten of things, and you have to try to be like, how do these all <laughs> connect to each other? Someone make me a book like that. I will buy it. Number 4. Vanny Many have theorized that Vanny and Vanessa are indeed the same person, and we have scrapped and hidden emails from Special Delivery to prove it. There are a few emails addressed to Ness, or Nessie97 as she is known, that imply Ness works for the company. It is believed based on the content of the emails that Ness is indeed Vanny, and we can theorize through these similar names that the two characters are actually one and the same, perhaps different personas belonging to the same person. One of which is infected, perhaps the virus from William Afton, which has her possessed by Glitch Trap making her kind of like the new glitch trap, if you will. Or perhaps her participation is more willfully involved than we suspect. I mean, just because she was referred to as a reluctant follower doesn't mean that she's still one now. Either way, Ness's username of Nessie97 could imply that Ness was born in 1997, as people often use their birth year and usernames to more easily identify themselves and for, you know, memorization purposes. Because you usually don't forget what year you were born. If Ness was born in 1997, this would mean by the year 2020 that she would be 23 years old. What? Especially if this game takes place, I think, after September, which I think is her birth month. That's also in the emails. If she is 23, this would match the age that was given to Vanessa A's records in the other scrapped emails. Connect the dots FNAF edition. Number 3. The New Antagonist Vanessa is also believed to be an Afton because if she is Vanny, she has some murderous tendencies for sure. I mean, she certainly appears menacing and dangerous in the trailer. And once again, we also have evidence from the scrapped emails of Special Delivery to back up her sinister presence and possibly plots. It's said that a virus was moved into some sort of programming using a false credential which allows those using the credentials to override security protocols on animatronics. Uh oh. It's also implied that Ness could be the culprit, although her fellow colleague is willing to believe that it wasn't her. Please. I don't know why I laughed at that, but Louis just cracks me up in these emails. He's so needy and he's so like, please date me, I'm Louis. And I'm like, oh my gosh. Louis, take a hint. I don't think Ness is interested. I'm sorry. We also know that Ness has been buying human-like face masks and has ordered fabric, possibly to build her bunny costume. Number 2. Heir of Afton Because of Vanny's menacing presence, who many believe to be Vanessa A, or in these emails, V underscore A, another, another persona just to add to her long lists, we can also find another connection here to the Afton name in the role that the character plays. Vanessa could actually be an active participant 
participant in this plot who is only pretending to be a good security guard to lure in her prey more easily. Which would make sense given what we know of the games and how victims are usually ensnared or entrapped in such a manner in the stories told there. Because of this method it is possible that Vanessa could actually be the heir of William Afton and either be taking up his last name in honor of him and maybe she's not directly related or she could actually be a relative of his, a daughter who has taken up the role of carrying on her father's vision, taking his place as the resident mass murderer of the Freddy Fazbear franchise. Number 1. Animatronic Master like a puppet master, you know? There are also theories that Vanessa has gone beyond the villain she aspires to be in terms of her capabilities, not just setting the animatronics loose on innocent victims and altering their safety settings, but in fact manipulating and controlling them remotely, including Vanny, something that Vanessa could be an Afton who aspires to be even greater than the person she reluctantly serves, and controls Vanny from afar, not appearing as her. Now, this would also protect her sort of like seeming innocence as well. So pretty smart. People have cited Vanny's jump scare and glowing red eyes as evidence as well as her constant references to glitching out, implying that if we are in the physical world that Vanny is actually a robot or animatronic controlled, perhaps even built by successor Vanessa Afton. And at 10 crushed Elizabeth. I mean, don't get me wrong, okay? Some specific kids make me understand William's whole MO, but the fact that he made these robots, especially the fun times, specifically to kill, and the first kid they kill is his own daughter. That's that's some serious karma, man. But considering how horrific Baby becomes after this, thanks to Elizabeth, I feel like she might have had it coming, okay? Girl was a lot more like her father than she really should have been, honestly. Well, yes, crushing any kid would have been bad, but like, your creator's daughter? Seriously? Like, why, why was there no blacklist for kids that you shouldn't grab? Like, you have animatronics that can walk on their own, advanced AI, facial recognition technology, but you can't make a goddamn program that says do not kill these kids, they come from my loins? Like, bro, if, if you ask me, you had it coming. Like, who tells their kids not to do something and then actually expects them to listen? Especially when it was built to attract and lure kids. A and when they're that young. Like, seriously, William is stupid. <laughs> but but this was still a messed up thing for Baby to do. And this is why she's more so Afton's creation than the other ones, because she's literally also his kid. And at 9, fought Ennard. FNAF 5 to 6 had some serious changes. Baby went from being a part of Ennard in FNAF 5 to her own separate animatronic again, with seemingly no explanation in FNAF 6. Well, no explanation if you're not really a FNAF fan. Since we all know that the interaction that caused this unfortunate split actually took place within the source code of Scott Cawthon's websites, where the two, scottgames.com and fnafworld.com, were arguing, which resulted in Baby getting voted off the island. But honestly, thinking about it, this was a pretty dumb idea for her. Like, it seems that Molten Freddy is the one controlling the blob from FNAF Security Breach, since they're the face that the blob prefers to use to the jump scare the player and interact with Afton, even though it's more Funtime Freddy and not Molten Freddy. But we also know that Molten Freddy is just the remains of Ennard after Baby got kicked out, hence why it dropped the whole clown aesthetic. It's also worth noting that Baby's face is on the blob, except it's missing the red light in its eyes, meaning that its soul is probably not contained within the animal animatronic amalgam. So if Baby had stayed a part of Ennard, she might still be fighting. Of course, we, we can't be certain that she's not possessing something else, but we can't be sure that she is either. And it ate after an amalgam. One of the biggest twists from the Fazbear Frights book's epilogue stories is that they end up fighting a giant trash rabbit known as the Afton amalgam. Yeah, but then a mysterious black blob is revealed to be behind everything. This blob was controlled by Baby, or I guess Elizabeth. Either way, at this point, it's the same thing. I'm guessing this reveal was originally intended to happen after Security Breach was released, given the original release date of the game, which would have made this much more rewarding and an actual, like, big reveal. But Baby was literally revealed to be controlling a version of her father, the man who got her killed by creating a robot designed to kill, the man who killed her brother in the same way, who killed five additional kids, at least, who wanted to bring her brother back as an animatronic. She controlled a version of him and still wanted to make him proud. 
At least she ended up abandoning him, but not for any moral reasons, but because she knew that the battle was lost and wanted to live to fight another day. Okay, well I say live, but in reality, just she didn't want to be destroyed since she's dead and possessing stuff. She's not really alive, but like, you know what I mean, okay? And at seven, kills her brother, or at least, Tries to. You see, since we play as Michael in every game of the original series, with the exception of FNAF 4 and 7, Michael is the one in danger. And since Baby's after us as the player in FNAF 5 and 6, she is legit trying to kill her brother. Especially in FNAF 6, holy damn. And she does so in such a menacing way. Being able to absolutely slaughter your brother without a moment's thought is probably one of the most messed up things Baby could have done. But if we're being honest at this point, she was kind of nuts at that point, so I think that it's, it's better to put this higher on the list. Like, honestly thinking about this, in the fifth game she wasn't really trying to kill him, just get inside him. Which sounds awful now that I say it out loud. Oh my god, what the flying f are these games? <laughs> But in Pizzeria Simulator, she definitely wanted to kill you. And during her final speech, she even thinks that it's what her father would want. So needless to say, she's pretty out of it at this point, which makes it slightly more forgiving, but not so much. And it's six, Scrapped. While she did end up fighting the rest of Enerdan getting kicked out, resulting in the creation of Molten Freddy, she also ended up having to remake herself, or at least give herself another shell, as well as seemingly another arm, since you know, now we see a, a giant claw on her left arm. However, you want to know something interesting? According to the Freddy Files updated edition, the bible of the FNAF franchise basically, the claw on her left arm is the same one from her stomach, meaning that Elizabeth knowingly attached the claw that resulted in her death to her arm. And that's absolutely terrifying. Like this chick is like, yeah, this thing killed me, so let's put it on my arm so I have better access to it. You know, just in case I need to use it for whatever reason. So yeah, this laced up her sneakers, thought, oh, what if I need to kill someone today? And said, might as well claw them to death with this monstrosity that killed me. Do you people not realize how absolutely nuts that is? Like that's, bro. Halfway through into number five, impress daddy. Along the same note of, uh, oh, I wanted that arm in case I needed to sever anybody's body parts or something. We know that's why she has it and not for self-defense. Before Henry cuts her off during the true ending to the game though, baby goes on a bit of a rant thinking that she won. Quote, you played right into our hands. Did you really think this job just fell out of the sky for you? No, it was a gift for us. You gathered them all together in one place, just like he asked you to. All of those little souls in one place, just for us, a gift. Now we can do what we were created to do and be complete. I will make you proud, daddy. Watch, listen, and be full. Does that sound like someone who wanted to be saved? No, she wants to impress her father, someone she knows was behind her death, and then every death after hers. She wants to kill for her father. And this lines up with so many other versions of her as well. Like I said earlier, the Afton Amalgam, she ended up fighting with her father until she knew the battle was lost. However, she didn't stop trying to impress him. And the same remains true here. It's messed up, okay? A little girl getting killed accidentally only for her to want to join her father's crusade? That's, that's messed up. And at four, killed technicians. The technicians were two employees of Fazbear Entertainment Inc., who used to work with the Funtime animatronics of Circus Babies Entertainment and Rental. One technician is soft-spoken and seems bored with his job, implying that he may be used to it, while the other, who speaks with using a Brooklyn accent, appears to be less experienced and more uneasy with the environment of Circus Babies Entertainment and Rental from FNAF Sister Location. Same. The two technicians appear for the first time during night 4 when they use the scooper on Ballora, and then during night 5, their dead bodies are seen hanging in the Ballora gallery and the Funtime Auditorium. They are assumed to have been killed by Baby and the gang, which sounds like a really weird band. However, there is also the theory that they've been dead for a while, or aren't even real, and Baby was just mimicking their voices so that she could manipulate the situation for you to trust her. However, I mean, these, these are like the first people aside from ourselves and any 8-bit minigames where we've actually seen someone die. Like every dead body that we've seen has been pixelated in a minigame up until this point. And they are also the first humans in all of FNAF to get their full bodies shown, even if it was through a shadow. But I don't know. Do you think that these were real or were they dummies? Make sure you let me know down in the comments. 
Getting close to the end, and in number three, impersonation. Identity theft is not a joke, Jim. Especially not when it's an animatronic impersonating a kid. Yep, that's right, ya yeah, heard correctly. Baby in the FNAF novels ends up impersonating Charlie, but not teen Charlie, nope. Instead, she ends up impersonating adult Charlie, because the books weren't complicated enough already. Basically, in the novels, Baby has the ability to change between a realistic looking human and her normal circus baby look. She she can do this thanks to the pin structures covering her body. No idea how that helps her go from a 7 foot tall animatronic to a 5 foot 9 woman, but oh well. Anyways, for some reason, Baby and Charlie's adult robot versions are the same robot. It's unclear why. Since Henry made a series of 4 robots for Charlie after Afton killed her in 1983, which doesn't make sense given what we know about the timeline already, but I guess it would have to be different in the books, because at that point, Elizabeth would have already been killed by an already created created baby animatronic, meaning that Henry would have made the first three robots from scratch, but thought, nah, I'll turn the adult one into a human from this robot here. And it just so happened to be Elizabeth Afton's possessed bot. But honestly, there are a whole load of plot holes in the books, so we'll, uh, We'll just ignore it. We'll, we'll push it to the side, you know? Either way, identity theft isn't cool. And boy, don't I know it. My dad removes the labels off of any mail we get and tears the, he shreds it, okay? He even made us rip our names off of papers when it has our names on it. Like, if even if it's schoolwork and it just had my first name or whatever it was, so that he would make us rip it, rip it off, rip that corner off so that we, he, people couldn't steal our identity. And now my name is just out there on the internet for everyone to see. So, uh, <laughs> you're welcome, Dad. Did anyone else's parents do that, or, or was it just the fact that my dad is the crazy paranoid uncle? Penultimately, in at number two, saved William. Assuming that baby is in control of the blob like she is in the Fast Bear Frights books, did she save Afton in the security breach true ending? While this ending was left vague for sequel purposes, I think it's not out of the question, especially since a load of people still want Afton to be alive for some reason. Like why can't you just let the man die off permanently and then go rot in hell? Okay, like like for real though. Ultimate Custom Night was supposed to be a form of hell, but not like actual hell. Like it was supposed to be an like eternal agony brought on by the vengeful spirit, but it, it wasn't actual hell. This man needs to suffer for his actions, okay? Even Satan would be appalled by this dude's crimes. Like gluttony, lust, greed, you do those things, you go downstairs a legend. But just offing a bunch of kids because you wanted to, and then discovering that it could make you immortal, is just hella messed up. Like I've said that Satan wouldn't approve of, of many things, particularly a load of versions of spiders from video games. But Satan wouldn't even like this guy, okay? Just like toss him in the empty or something, and you just he'd let him be alone forever. Something like that. Like goddamn. And then and the baby saves this man? The man who got her killed? Yeah, that's definitely one of the worst things she's done, even like especially to her own psyche. And finally, in at number one, Betrayal. Top 10 worst anime betrayals, but it's FNAF. In Sister Location, we thought that we actually had the first nice animatronic. Like, basically a prototype for Glamrock Freddy. Baby was giving us tips on how to survive, she helped us get through Ballora's gallery, she really seemed like she wanted us to live. But then, what do we get for trusting her? Scooped and stuffed, just like a Thanksgiving turkey. This was probably one of the most brutal things to happen to a character in the entire series, and it's all because we trusted Baby. She made us feel safe, she gave us confidence, she prevented us from getting killed, only to use our body as a skin suit, and then get kicked out of Ennard not even a game later. This is why I didn't trust Glamrock Freddy. Baby is legit one of the reasons that I have trust issues, and that's saying something. Like, holy damn, okay? I, I could have sworn that Glamrock Freddy was going to do the exact same thing. Th then, like, he would lead us down to Afton and then pull, like, a psych, I've been working for this bag the whole time, motherfucker, time to die. But he didn't. However, thanks to Baby, I still think that this man is doing a long con. In a 10, Markiplier cameo. Yep, you heard me right. In a recent interview with Variety, Markiplier was asked about the FNAF movie, and implied quite heavily that he will be making an appearance, saying, quote, Everyone wants to know. There was a lot of confusion. Yeah, I can't say anything particular about that. There was a lot of scheduling conflict, and I can't say anything. Which was his way of saying that he's at least making a cameo, because why, why else would 
would there be scheduling conflicts if he didn't need to have free time for this? You know, like if he wasn't in the movie, he wouldn't have had any schedule conflicts because there wouldn't be anything to conflict with. You know what I'm saying? And given a number later on this list, it's entirely possible that there are even more cameos than we were expecting. More on that later. Guess you're gonna have to stick around. And at 9, Young Vanessa. Now, last time I mentioned that one of the interesting things about the casting choices is that someone has been cast as Vanessa. Yeah. Interestingly enough, there is a Vanessa character on the cast list, despite the Vanessa we know not being introduced until Security Breach, where she seems to be in her early 20s. And considering how Security Breach takes place after FNAF 6, which takes place post-2023 at least, it shouldn't be the same Vanessa in this movie, unless it's like a robot situation like in the novels. But nevertheless, there is a Vanessa in this film. But now, it seems that there has been a casting call for a young Vanessa as well. Meaning that the idea that this is a robot Elizabeth, but like the adult version, is less likely. However, it's entirely possible that the young Vanessa is just a younger version of one of the robots. Like, again, a fourth closet situation where there's multiple. So, we won't really know until the movie comes out. And also, if you're excited for the FNAF movie, be sure you hit subscribe, because we're, we're going to be covering it as much as we can, alright? Maybe we'll even do some one-off videos here and there, saying like, hey, here's something that happened. And at 8, Victoria Patnod. While there haven't been really many major reveals since the last video, there have been quite a few casting announcements. One of these is Victoria Patnod, I hope I'm saying that right, as currently a unnamed social worker. And this seems like a likely stand-in for a social worker who's assigned to Michael after Crying Child dies, as basically the therapist who tries to help him forgive himself and move on with his life. Or that was just like their way of like avoiding sending him to jail for manslaughter. This could be the case, and honestly I think that it is the most likely scenario, but I think that she could have more significance than that as well. I mean like, if this is meant to be the first three games in the movie, Michael is going going to need a reason to start working against his father, and a social worker that his father was paying for in an effort to keep him from the truth that Mike then revisits after he snaps for the first time in a decade with the fountain fight, then that social worker revealing everything about his father could be quite the compelling narrative. And it's 7 Dr. Lillian. Speaking of crying, child, he's most definitely going to get bit in this movie. Like, come on, I mean, that moment, the bite of 83, is the catalyst for a whole load of the series. Without the chomping, Mike wouldn't have had a reason to go against his father, and we never would have gotten the games. And since this movie is taking place in the 80s, I'm guessing that crying child is going to die either early on or in flashbacks. Or dare I say, fnaf -shbacks. Eh? Sorry, I've been gone for a while. So when Tazaday Young was listed as Dr. Lillian on the movie's IMDb, it's actually very possibly the doctor that looks after Crying Child after he gets chopped. Originally, I thought Dr. Lillian would be the therapist that Mike was seeing, but after the social worker reveal, I think it definitely makes more sense that the Lillian is the medical doctor. Also, fun fact, Tadase Young was in an episode of the Winchesters, meaning that the FNAF movie is in the supernatural multiverse, and by extension, the Arrowverse, thanks to that one Legends of Tomorrow episode. You're welcome. In at six, Bailey Winston. Now, there is very little information about this one, but according to their actor's access resume, Bailey Winston has been cast in the FNAF movie as Kim. We don't know who the character is, uh, we don't know if this is a fake name or if the character is like the equivalent to a character from the games, but it could be that the character was created for the purposes of the movie, since there are more characters needed for a movie than in a game where the story is contained to only the aspects that we need to see, and b everyone else aside from us basically are animatronics. So these could be entirely new characters that are being introduced in into this series that could have no equivalent in the games, or it could be that they are meant to be characters from the games, but with new names to show us that these aren't the same worlds, as a way to keep the mystery of the games alive and not solved by the movie so that they can continue to release the games and do well. <sighs> Corporate America. Halfway through in number 5, Afton Family. It also appears as if the entire Afton Family has been cast in the movie, or at least um, is planned on being cast. Matthew Lillard as William, Josh Hutcherson as Mike, Lucas Grant as Crying Child, whose character is currently named Garrett, Mary Stuart Masterson as a female villain who could be the mother, but Elizabeth is where it gets kind of complicated. While with the mother and Crying Child, we can be a little loose with their names, since we never really knew them, we know Elizabeth's name. 
So while some people think that Piper Rubio as Abby could be Elizabeth, that doesn't seem all too likely. I mean like we have names of half the Aftons as their in game versions, so why would we change the daughter that a whole load of people are fans of? That, that seems like it would cause some issues. It could also be possible that the younger Vanessa that is meant to be cast is going to be Elizabeth, uh, which would mean that the entire family hasn't been cast yet, but it's possible. Abby could also be meant to be the movie version of Charlie, Henry's daughter. So since these characters are using names that we haven't seen before, it's difficult to know who could be involved, which I think is basically the point, since if pictures leak of let's say the characters Carl and Garrett doing scenes, we don't know if that's because Garrett isn't meant to be crying child, or if Carl is someone else entirely. So it's a good way to protect the story while also giving fans something to chew on and talk about to death, like us. In it for YouTubers. While Markiplier seems to be implying that he'll be making an appearance in the FNAF movie, there are some other YouTubers who flat out said that they were invited to the set to check out the filming. The four that we know of, of course, being Docco, as well as 8-Bit Ryan, Rasbowski, and Basimalum, aka the Theory Thursday crew. From the looks of things, they're just going to vlog on the set and film content for their respective channels. However, there could be something more here like cameos or consultation that they haven't revealed for obvious reasons. Although so consultation would be like far less of a major thing uh, and considering how Scott is on set we don't really need someone else there to consult them but it could be like a consulting them from like a fans perspective kind of thing and how we as outsiders see the series without knowing the full story like Scott does so who knows? Getting close to the end in number three, Freddy Fazbear first look. We did actually get a set photo of what is presumably the Freddy animatronic made by Jim Henson's Creature Shop around the time of the last part as well. There was only the one photo and it was very far away so the quality was abysmal, but if I'm honest it actually gave me hope for the movie and more than I had originally. I thought the animatronics for the movie would be CGI or closer to like the Iron Man suits in the MCU where only part of the character is practical and then they fill in the rest with CGI, or that it would be an animatronic suit, but with a dude wearing a green morph suit on the inside being the endoskeleton. But seeing the animatronic without green and actually looking like what I pictured a real Freddy to look like is absolutely insane and incredibly encouraging. Blumhouse was put on the map with Paranormal Activity, and that was with a minimal budget, but with everything they can do now, they're not holding back with this movie, and it brings me joy, okay? I'm really hoping that this movie is good. And ultimately, in at number two, Michael Whalen. Michael Whalen is now listed on the IMDb page for the FNAF movie as the composer and conductor. Whalen is a two-time Emmy Award winning composer known for films like Dallas Buyers Club, What's Eating Dad, Veronica Decides to Die, and interestingly, the Pokemon Puzzle League video game from 2000, and the Oprah Winfrey Show for one episode. So yeah, if they got an Emmy Award winning composer on this project, you know that the sound design and atmosphere is going to be excellent. I am preparing for this movie to be terrifying, uh, despite hating horror myself, but mostly I hate horror because jump scares are just too much sensory overload at once, and it messes with my brain to such a degree that it actually like makes me angry. Uh, yeah, like, come on, guys. Being scared is not a good thing, people. But also, I say that, and that, like, I say that I hate being scared, yet I, I was hit by a car a few days ago and only went to the hospital because I thought that the bike I was on was broken. That's... That's, that, that's why I'm, now I have the band-aid on. Yeah, if I didn't think it was broken, I would have just kept going to my destination, but I didn't think I had a way back to my hotel. So yeah, that's the only reason I stopped. <laughs> I wasn't scared at all for that, which is super weird. Um, and then I also was thinking while I was flying that if the plane crashed, at least I would be able to put my 100 hours playing the forest to use. So, so yeah, fear is, is weird with me. Are we sure I only have six mental disorders? And finally, in at number one, spring trap. I saw multiple tweets saying that the FNAF movie was going to be about the first three games in the series, which didn't seem all that logical to me, because like, why would they try and cram three games and nearly 40 years of content into one movie? We all know that that usually doesn't go over well. And while Fazbear's Fright may have opened in 2023, which makes the timing perfect, we weren't really sure that it was true. Until an Instagram user in a now deleted post shared photos from their tour of Jim Henson's Creature Shop, which included multiple spring traps 
have heads, indicating that they're definitely planning on having him appear. And considering everything else, it basically confirms Springtrap to be in the movie. Probably towards the end if they're doing it linearly, but it could be uh, jumping around a bit depending on the plot. It's also worth noting that there's another head in the background of the last image of the collage that seems to be extremely similar to Monty after being broken in Security Breach. But considering how Security Breach takes place years after FNAF 6, meaning decades after FNAF 3, it's unlikely that he'll appear in this movie, but probably in the third that they have planned, considering how Matthew Lillard did sign contracts for three films. So they could already be working on their other props, uh, but these could also just simply be remains from another project. Thank you.